And so, hi everyone. I can't believe it's the second last um, presentation already. Um, so for most of you who have attended this, um, I'll just do a quick um, introduction about myself and then introduce our wonderful speaker. So my name is Tram Nguyen and I'm the University of Washington's um, 2022 Fulbright Canada Chair in Arctic Studies. This presentation is sponsored by the Canadian Study Centre in the Henry Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. With funding support from the Global Innovations Grant from the UW Office of Global Affairs. So this talk is going to become part of the Canadian Study Centre's Arctic and International Relations series and posted on our website, as Marianne mentioned. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, Kitty Gordon Morovic, and her presentation is entitled The Health Network in Nunavik. And she was born and raised in Kujiak, Quebec, and she was raised by her grandparents and spent her early childhood in the capital of Nunavik called Kujiak, which means big river. She's currently the director of out of region services within the Nunavik Health Network, a position that oversees medical services given to Nunavik patients outside of the region to ensure they have access to specialized services not offered in the Nunavik region. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Kitty. Kitty, welcome. We're so lucky to have you. Um, and I'm really excited for, for your presentation today. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Kitty Gordon. I, um, as Tram said, I am from uh, Kujuak. I was born and raised um, in the capital of Nunavik. Um, we call it the capital because it's, it's the largest community of 14. Um, and this is where all the main uh, regional offices are located. So it's our, um, it's our metropolis of 2,500. <laughs> um, so the Nunavik population has about 14, 11 to 14,000 Inuit. Um, it's above the 55th parallel, as you guys may know. And um, um, Nunavik, the Nunavik region is still very much developing um, to this day. And I'm gonna speak about, I have no formal presentation, but I'm just gonna speak of my experience that I have um, within the health network. So um, Prior to the health network, I used to work for McAvee Corporation, and um, this is when I first met Nadine. And I had the opportunity to work with her back in 2011, where um, I worked with her with another um, fellow Nunavim mute on a task force. And um, so this is when I first met Nadine. And um, so in, this is when I was working for McAvee at the time. Um, and then I moved back to Kujuak, uh, to my hometown um, in 2014, um, where um, I spent seven years. And this was my first introduction to the health network. Um, I worked as a complaints commissioner and um, complete stranger to anything health related. So I have no formal education in, in health but I do have a certification in management um, with the McGill University, uh, a 30 credit program that I completed last year. And um, so we have the Nunavik Regional Board of Health and Social Services and it composed of six main departments. Um, there's the executive management department, there's a department of public health, uh, the department of uh, planning and programming, uh, the department of administrative services, the Department of Inuit Values and Practices, the Department of Out of Region Services, which I um, recently um, obtained the position of director, and the Department of uh, Human Resources Development. Um, so prior to being director of uh, the Out of Region Services, I was in um, the Public Health Department um, after being Complaints Commissioner from 2014 to 2017. So um, I was assistant director of public health for the region and um, with COVID, oh my goodness, with COVID. <laughs> um, we had a lot of challenges, um, I guess with the population with dealing with COVID in the region um, in trying to get our vaccination rates up um, in trying to convince the population in, in believing in, in the system. And um, with this, I think it brought back a lot of memories of colonialism. Um, 
I say that because our regional doctor, Dr. Marie Rachette, is non Inuit, and um, a lot of the different communi communities felt like it was colonialism all over again by being imposed guidelines and measures. So this kind of um, reminded some people maybe of what colonial colonialism was. So um, we had um, kind of a hard time at the at the beginning of the pandemic um, in, in dealing with the population and, ga and gaining their trust back. Um, so th those were some of the issues that we had. And um, the principal mandate of the health board is to organize the programs within the region and ensure that there's access of access to services um, for the for our population. So under um, the health board, we have the MSSS, the Ministry of Health and Social Services, um, the Nunavik Regional Board of Health and Social Services, and the two health centers, um, which is Inuit Civic Health Center, and then um, the Dulatavik Angava Dulatavik Health Center, which um, each of them have respective seven uh, nursing stations or CLSCs, often referred to, referred to as nursing stations in the small communities. Um, so our main interest is to ensure that um, our population has access to these services and ensure that they are culturally relevant. Um, however, there is, um, like, I, like I mentioned before, we have uh, uh, the Nunavik region is still very much developing. We have um, a high suicide rate. We have a major shortage of housing. Um, most of the main, most of the major uh, medical emergencies that need to be, uh, that need uh, medical at at attention have to be flown either to Montreal or Quebec City um, as we don't have, um, the services that are that are required um, for our region. So as I mentioned before, um, there's nursing stations in each of the um, 14 communities and there's two regional main hospitals, if you at will, one on the Angava Coast, the UTHC, and one on the um, uh, Hudson Coast, the Inuit Civic Health Center. Um, so this is, this is um, primarily what uh, the health and social services is made up of, is to ensure that the Inuit population has access to services. Um, however, there is of course challenges uh, that come with serving um, an indigenous population from non-Inuit. For example, um, I'm going to give myself as an example. As complaints commissioner, I noticed that, um, well, first of all, the position of com complaints commissioner was vacant for many, many years. And so um, it became a habit for the population to kind of not voice their concerns and what um, um, to make actually make complaints because they have the right to make a complaint. Um, and um, having an Inuit Complaints Commissioner was more approachable for uh, my fellow Inuit. So there's, we're still facing a lot of systemic racism, if you will, um, within our region, um, whether it be um, in the hospitals or um, uh, even within, within regional offices such as, such as the KRG or um, so it's, it, there's a lot of, um, racial tension, if you will, um, within our communities. And there's a lot of maybe some mistrust, um, from service providers, such as, um, the smaller hospitals or doctors or, um, because they are non-Inuit. Um, so, and I think the result of that is three major uh, impacts, uh, three major events that had an impact on our culture is um, the dog slaughter, the relocation and the residential schools. And from there, um, 
this is where the alcoholism came in, this is where drug abuse came in, and then from there, um, intergenerational trauma and the suicide rates um, shooting up. And um, so we are in the middle of developing our region and forming services that are culturally relevant and wanting to get more Inuit professionals to serve um, our population for uh, Inuit by Inuit. So um, we do have a few few challenges, as I mentioned before, with the um, with the development um, and um, for example, another simple example is um, because the houses up north um, do not have underground pipes for water delivery and sewage delivery. Um, there's often days where there's no water service, there's no sewage service and disease is spreading faster. So this is one of the major things that we were facing also during the pandemic is that there was outbreaks in small communities because there was lack of service for water or lack of service for sewage. Um, so these are kind of issues that we are facing to this day. Um, so, and I remember as a child, um, when my grandparents would receive letters from either government or um, any kind of um, letter non in, um, in non institute I remember trying to help them and this, I always go back to this um, uh, idea of wanting to help my other, my fellow Inuit is, is I want to be there of help for them, for the population, for them to better understand their rights and, and the services and um, so that uh, for the, for the well being of our population. So um, this is kind of what I do in, um, in, in, in my community, in my region. Uh, is there any questions? Does anyone have a question or comment for Kitty? Um, I have a question if that's all right. Sure. Uh, um, I know you talked about how you don't have um, formal health education and I was just wondering like, how that has impacted your work and like what kind of barriers you've had to overcome as a result of that and like I guess sort of what the reaction of your peers was and like how you might have overcame those barriers sorry that's very vague but I'm curious um I think maybe it's just asking questions along the way like uh, there's not very many directors in in um inuit directors um in the region um most of the, the simple jobs um are filled by are are filled by non inuit and i think education is 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 a key component right now um for example my children i recently moved to montreal because the, there's a huge gap in the education, education system in the Nunavik region as compared to Southern Canada. Um, when we came down, I, we learned that my children were two years behind. So um, there's some work to be done in the education sector. Um, there's no colleges up north. There's no um, the, the, the opportunities are very limited even in services, um, there's very limited uh, businesses. Um, there's no optometry, there's no malls. So there's uh, those, these are just simple examples that I've given out, but um, there's, there's a lot of um, positions that can be filled by Inuit, um, but because they don't have a secondary five education, um, these positions are being filled by non-Inuit that are not from the region. And th this in turn is creating um, racial tension between um, Inuit and non-Inuit. 
This is one of the examples. Does that answer your question, Ruby? Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. I think Robert has his hand up. Yeah. I'm curious. Uh, is your community about 60 north? Yes. It, well, above the 55th parallel. Okay. Um, do they have, is the ground frozen most of the year? I would say half the communities, yes. The further north you go, the, 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 the ground is frozen. Okay. Um, do the, does members of your community have um, septic tanks and sewer, septic sewer systems? All of the houses have septic tanks. There's one community out of 14 that have underground um, pipes. Wow. There's a lot of work to be done. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, have they can? Do you know how far you're? Are you above Quebec or are you? Are you uh, excuse me, in Ottawa or Montreal? We're yeah. we're within the province of Quebec. We're um, north of, of of Montreal. Montreal. Okay. There's um. Have you? Has your community considered looking at um, cargo containers for housing? They've um, prefab houses have started in the communities. Um, most of the houses are social housing, um, but there is some private home ownership programs. What is social housing? Social housing is um, subsidized by the local housing bureau, the regional housing bureau, where um, it's not. It does. You don't own the house. You right. renting. Okay. And I would say about 90% of the houses are social housing. Okay. Would they, because it's not difficult to convert uh, a, one or two cargo containers into a nice house. I was wondering if they've ever considered that. There hasn't been any cargo containers that have been turned into housing, but um, um, there's still a lot of work to do. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Robert, for your question. Um, I see that the, a lot of the audience members are actually students in the class. So um, maybe this is one of the rare opportunities when we'll have a little more time with our guest speakers. So I would encourage um, the class to start asking their questions for, for Kitty. What I could do is also share some links to um, to some stuff that could be interesting for you guys. Uh, as an example, uh, we had a health survey that was undertaken in 2017 um, mm -hmm. throughout the entire region. And this kind of gives a pulse as to what kind of uh, health our population is in. Um, for example, we have a 70% smoking rate in our region. Um, alcoholism is rampant. Um, so there's all kinds of social issues that we are facing today. Um, by knowing these kinds of results, this will allow us to uh, know better what the needs are for the region, what kind of um, programs and services can be formed by um, looking at the results and seeing what there is. So. Um, I'll send a link uh, um, to a about I think it's a 40 minute video about the survey um, that was conducted in 2017. That would be great Kitty and feel free to send that to me or you can put that in the chat, um, whichever is convenient for you and I can share that. Okay. Um, I also have a lot of questions but I'll give the students an opportunity first. Um, so Luke, I see your hand is up. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so I kind of have like a, a two part question here. Um, over the handful of speakers um, that we've heard, I think I've kind of, I've heard a consistent theme with like a mistrust in the healthcare system. And so I was just wondering, um, like if this issue, like if the mistreatment of um, the Inuit communities is still kind of ongoing, which would kind of create that mistrust. Mm -hmm. And then if it's kind of diminished a little bit and they're trying to fix these things 
um, how could, um, or what, what do you think would be the best way to help regain this trust? I think maybe having uh, more Inu agents that can speak publicly on the radio because the radio is still very much um, community regional radio or regional radio is, is a very strong medium to communicate to the population. I think it's a matter of assuring the population what's being done. Um, um, like again, for example, right now there's, uh, there's a TB outbreak still happening to this day. Um, and a lot of the people will not go to the hospital to get checked because they either um, don't wanna be stigmatized or um, uh, they're ashamed or they simply don't wanna go to the hospital because they don't trust or... Um, so I think it's a matter of communicating to the population and reassuring them. Um, so um, it, it, it takes, it'll take some time. Okay, cool. That that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, Amber, did I see your, your hand go up? Oh, Arbaz. Arbaz. Hi. Uh, so I had another question uh, about social housing. Um, so I heard that it was uh, rented and subsidized a little bit. Um, so I was wondering what else might be entailed in that, because uh, there's other like costs associated with living. Uh, so I'm wondering like, if they subsidize things such as internet and phone lines, um, or if they do anything uh, with regards to like food uh, or electricity. Um, and I'm also wondering how like how okay is the because I know rent prices can be crazy even if they are subsidized. Um, so I'm I'm wondering how how much that actually helps. So the subsidized housing actually works on a point system. Um, so the lower income you have, the lower rate it'll be. Um, we have terribly, terribly, terribly slow internet um, to this day. This is something that's not subsidized. It's very expensive. The cost of living of food is very expensive. However, there is um, subsidized um, for more nutritious food, um, produce, meat, um, milk, dairy. And there's programs that exist for um, pregnant mothers where they get coupons monthly from the local uh, CLSC to help by um, healthy foods such as cereal, produce, uh, meats, um, and stuff like that. So there is programs that do exist, but the cost of living is still very high. Um, like again, as an example, when I was, I, 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 we would have to like on Facebook. It's a powerful tool. Um, we actually go on Facebook and say, does anybody have a ripe avocado that I'll replace tomorrow because there's none in town. So um, stuff like that. It's, it's, there's daily flights that do go up to Kujuak, the jet that goes up to Kujuak and then there's smaller planes that go into the smaller communities. So the further you are, the more expensive it is and the less nutritious food there is. So um, it's, it's a challenge. But um, Inuit are, are a happy people regardless of any situation. I think it comes from, um, um, from within our culture is all about sharing and going out on the land and programs have started shaping where um, people are, are, there's programs that you can go out on the land to go camping as a healing um, program. So there's things that are being shaped and formed that are relevant to our culture, um, despite the challenges that we face. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that helps a lot. Uh, Spencer, I see your hand again. Yeah, so on the food aspect, um, how impactful how relevant is like subsistence hunting and is that decreasing like are there impacts from either quotas or just decreased catch that are 
uh, being seen more often in modern times than previously? Um, there's actually also another program that I wanted to share that I forgot. It's called the um, Hunter Support Program, where each community has a community freezer. And the local program um, hires hunters to go hunting and fill the freezer. And it's open to all of the community. Um, quotas have definitely had an impact, um, especially on Beluga, um, where it's it was a lot more scarce. Um, having Beluga, getting any Beluga for a while was, was um, hard to get. Um, so there is still a lot of hunting and sharing, um, but it's expensive. Gasoline is expensive, equipment is expensive, skidoos, um, the tools you need to go out hunting. So it's, if you wanna become a hunter, you need, you need money. I see, interesting, thank you. Uh, Robert, did you have another question? Yeah, what's the, uh, what do they do for energy? Energy, well, there's um, hydro plants in each community. Okay. There's, there's no there's no clean energy that's still undeveloped. What's the average wind speed? Ooh, it depends on which community. Uh, in just above 60 north. Above 60? Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't know the exact number, but there are some days where you can be stuck in a community for several days because of wind. Okay. Have you guys, has anybody looked at the Icelanders for their wind turbines? I wouldn't know. Um, yeah, they make really good wind turbines that can power a lot or a little, you know, it depends on, they come in various sizes. Mm -hmm. and they're, I, sus I suspect they're competitively priced, but I haven't checked that out, mm -hmm. but I, I pass that on. Okay, thank you for that. That's a good tip. Thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to mention also, also uh, the communities are a very young population. Um, at one point it was like 50% of the population that was under 25, which was about 10 years ago. So um, the population is still very young. Um, there's still a lot of development to do. Um, there's no kind of clean energy sources yet. Um, and the communities were formed not that long ago. I mean, we went from igloos to internet in 40 years. So my, my grandparents grew up on the land um, they were born in igloos and tents and, um, and that was not that long ago. So we still have a very young population and um, there's still a lot of development to do. I'll invite um, Amber to ask her question. Oh, um, okay, so uh, my question is, do you think it is like, necessary for the region to like establish a law about like teenager and alcohol and then like uh, the restriction on there and then like um, their health like in order to solve their health problem mm -hmm. um there's two communities or three communities that sell alcohol and the rest of the communities are dry communities, but bootlegging is rampant. Um, where a bottle of a 12 ounce small alcohol goes upwards of under $150. Um, so, and, and some of the communities it's, uh, we've heard, I heard not too long ago where they're using hand sanitizer as a source of alcohol. So there's social issues that intergenerational trauma that was passed down from their grandparents down to today's youth um, 
that that have not been solved yet that have not healed they have not healed properly and so um alcoholism and drug use is is a major problem i see haley has her haley yeah. go ahead um, haley yeah i was wondering um you mentioned that if there's like no renewable sources um up there in your community is there a lot of like oil drilling and um even outside of it are like um people from like like uh the more southern areas coming to drill um oil up there there's no oil yet um but there is mining for nickel um iron ore is under development um but there's no kind of oil that's being um because we are so far up north i guess i haven't ever heard of any oil being drilled in our region okay thank you you're welcome sarah hi thank you for sharing i was wondering at one point you mentioned how important it is for there to be accessible and culturally relevant services. I was wondering if you could give some examples of culturally relevant services that you think are really important. Okay. Um, for example, there's a program called the Sakhiyuk, which means, which translates to um, the wind has died down or the wind of change. Um, because there is such a high number of alcohol related arrests in some of the communities. Um, so this program was created to kind of like be a layer between the population and the police force. So um, stuff that could be easily solved by having a conversation with let's say an ine inebriated person instead of a police officer coming in and arresting that person and acting um, and, and not you know, acting according to what the police officer says is to create um, a program where um, agents could come and help and be help um, curb um, the number of uh, arrests that are being made um, where it could become like a, uh, the, uh, this group of people could be taking out these people who have been in and out of jail, um, take them in and take them out hunting and you uh, do some culturally uh, related activities um, and kind of get back into our um, customs and traditions. So there's, uh, that's, one example, and another one is called the Nunambi program, where you take, um, it's, it's like a call for interest for anybody who wants to um, go out on the land and with a group of people and um, basically take advantage of this program and go out on the land and enjoy the land. Because being out on the land is like a form of healing and going back to um, uh, our customs and traditions is, is still very much a part of our identity. Um, so those are two examples of, of um, uh, creating services that are culturally relevant. And another thing that um, the health board, health board does, does is um, uh, for people who are new to the region, they take a three-day culturally um, sensitivity program where they are um introduced to um how the system works or how it, it works presently and what kind of um traumatic events um our population went through in order to understand why it is the way it is today so kind of giving them a background as to why um there is such a high suicide rate why is there such a um high um, dropout rate, um, why is there no social housing, um, so stuff like that, so um, creating, the, it, it's all about awareness, at the end of the day, is about awareness. Can I see Luke? 
Do you have a comment or a question? Yeah, I just kind of had a follow up question about uh, one of the discussions. Um, so uh, in regards to alcoholism and suicide, um, I was just wondering how widely used therapy was being used um, to help resolve these issues or if there was like a board or something that was helping to promote these things. We actually have a shortage of psychologists in the region as well. So um, programs, um, anything that has to do with, like for example, there's a huge revival in, in cultural activities um, where they take workshops on how to make chemics, on how to tan caribou hide. So anything that's kind of culturally related is like a form of suicide prevention. Um, with the shortage of social workers, even within our schools, I, there's we have a shortage of teachers. There's a short of, shortage of everything. Um, we have to find ways to kind of try and um, figure out how to deal with, uh, with what's happening. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I'll invite Claire to ask her question. Yeah, I was also um, kind of thinking about the mental health care aspect of it. Um, and I was curious, um, I guess, if or how you think climate change is impacting the health of Inuit communities in Nunavik, I guess, broad health or mental health specifically, either one. Climate change is um, at the beginning stages of being kind of a conversation in the region. Um, there's been like one workshop on climate change and how it's affecting the hunters. Um, but like, there's no real, there hasn't been a connection made yet between climate change and mental health yet. So that still needs to be um, kind of bridged. But um, conversations around about climate change are just are just beginning. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question or comment for Kitty? I don't think I've missed anyone. Um, anyone? I think most of the students have asked their questions. I, I have a question <laughs> um, for you, Kitty. Um, so we've talked a lot, we've mentioned a lot of issues in terms of housing, um, uh, you know, drug abuse. Um, I wonder from your perspective and experience, what are the top two um, priority areas that, that you see in need of addressing and why? Um. That's a, that would be a good kind of a debate, really. Like, for example, um, my community of Kujwa, which already has a beer store and the, the, like a case of beer goes for, a case of 12 goes upwards of $60 at the local co-op store. And um, they're in the middle of discussing opening up another beer store in the community. And that's caused a lot of debate within the community. Why not build something that's for children? That why, why not build a new playground or um, something that's for the community? Um, and then in turn, they've said that with the profits, this is what they're gonna build uh, community infrastructure with is with the profit of the beer sales. So it's, it's kind of like, um, and I think, Maybe the more you restrict alcohol, the more um, people are gonna go, uh, the more money the bootleggers are going to make because as I mentioned before, a bottle of 12 ounce vodka goes for $150 in the smaller communities. So I think maybe if, our, because alcohol is still very new within our like it was introduced two or three generations ago and the Inuit do not know how to kind of 
some of them um, don't know how to properly enjoy um, alcohol. I think maybe if there is workshops on how to, I don't know, how to have a glass of wine without getting sloshed every single time. If, if there's more awareness programs that are created, I think maybe this can help the community, but this is something that's that's a good discussion to have. But if I can go back to your question, what are the top two priorities in what you were, what was the question? Top two priority areas that need, uh, that are in need of addressing from your experience. So one would be the alcohol um, uh, issue and what alcohol, would be kind of the second issue? Yeah, mm -hmm. raising awareness on the alcohol issue and um, social housing. I think mm. social housing is one of the top, like it's the very top, top issue that we're facing right now because there's people that are literally living on top of each other um, and this, there's no privacy, disease spreads easily. Um, uh, there's more, there's more abuse going on. And so I think if everybody had their own space, it would create more harmony in their lives so housing and alcoholism I think would be the in my opinion the top mm -hmm. two issues to mm -hmm. look into more right and just as a follow-up to the housing because I think it touches on or overlaps with some of the issues that our other speakers have also mentioned is this housing crisis um, so we've definitely identified it as an issue but I also wonder from your experience what are some potential solutions like what like you know if if you could be granted <laughs> uh, the perfect solution tomorrow. Um, um, what would you envision that solution to be? Um, I, again, based on your experience and building more houses, mm -hmm. building more houses. And I often said, I've often said to myself, I think being a single Inuk man is probably the most difficult thing. Um, I'll use my brother as an example. Um, he's basically um, an invisible homeless person because he doesn't have his own space. He's, because he doesn't have a family of his own and because he's not on the top of the list to get a house, he, when is he ever gonna get a house? Like he's, he's almost in his forties and he still doesn't have his house because Again, the list is long and the people that are prioritized is the ones with families. So being a single Inuk man is probably one of the most difficult things to be with, you know, um, the dog slaughter and, and the intergenerational trauma that's passed on from generation to generation and men typically not um, being stigmatized for, for um, like the, the mental health awareness, again, even today within the non-Inuit um, groups, mental health of men is not very much talked about, right? So imagine being visible minority and being a man and, you know, it's, it, it must not be easy. Mm -hmm. So how, how are people coping, Kitty? I mean, you know, it's building houses take time takes funding and also there's a limited period in which houses can be built um in in the north like construction season if if, if you will um so how are single people coping other than you know having to be forced at times to move away from from their home to find to find a place in in the south i think numbing themselves with alcohol because right now mm -hmm. like I said, there's such a high rate of alcoholism the suicide rate is very high. Um, I mean, I could name like two of my cousins committed suicide and like a handful of my friends. So the coping is, is not easy. Um, and I think a lot of them are to this day numbing themselves with alcohol and drugs. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, it's awesome definitely a complex um, issue and it, it, it seems like a vicious cycle that all, our, our other speakers have touched on as well. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the other thing that, that, that you spoke about that sparked my curiosity as really interested in one of the students touched on is um, culturally relevant programs. 
and how important that is. Um, you know, not just within Northern communities, but each individual community is also distinct and different. Um, so I wonder if you can speak to, um, I, I know you've, you've already mentioned an example, but if you yourself have been involved in, um, you know, a research project or, you know, uh, um, any kind of initiative that is a, in indirect response to the community, right? That comes from the need of the community for culturally relevant programs. And what was that process like? Um, definitely not easy. Um, and they, they're only starting to come out in the past few years. The culture, before that, it was like even more of a cultural divide between professionals mm -hmm. and uh, between professionals and Inuit. So there was I think maybe if there could be some kind of a hybrid, like if if the non-Inuit could not have their um, préjugé, how I would say préjugé in English, because it, yeah, stereo like stereotyping Inuit is not going to help, and that's just gonna um, drive them further apart. So I think maybe it's creating these friendships and creating programs within the community um, if they could, I don't know, if programs could be organized where professionals and local communities could kind of mingle and start um, making friendships between themselves and creating bonds and, and finding that trust between the two because Inuit can be very racist too and be like, nope, there's no way I'm going to ask for help because they're this way because there it's if we can get the two different groups to mingle with one another and start creating bonds and friendships and trust i think that would be um the the, the first thing to do thank you kitty um i think i've asked <laughs> too many <laughs> questions i'll save some for for the class um, but uh, I, I, I think that's, um, that's all the questions I have. And I think most of the students have also asked their questions. So we might be able to end a little early. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to find the, um, the link to the link. Uh, to the show that I wanted to share with you guys that 45 minute video of, of you'll get to see of what it was like to undertake this huge health survey. It was actually a ship that went to each and every community in the North and it was over a span of two to three months um, where um, questions were asked about social, um, nutritional, um, anything to do with the, the communities, really. Um, it's a really interesting kind of a short film. And I encourage the class to take note of this link. Uh, it might be useful for your um, independent study in one way or another. Let me find. And if you just go into YouTube and type in Kujwa, you'll find videos of my home community and what it's like and see um, see what it really is like up north and it'll show you on the map. I mean, I'm sorry I didn't share with you guys on a presentation today, but um, sometimes Google is your best friend. Huh? How do, you, how do you spell your community? A U U. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm going to spell it. I need, I'll type it in here. Okay. U U J J U A Q. So uh, there's no roads between. There's no roads connecting the communities. Okay. And you could only get there by plane or by skidoo in the winter, by boat. 
they're all very coastal communities, so very much connected to the land and the environments and what the land has to offer. Um, and then, and then they got colonized. <laughs> But um, yes, I, I encourage you guys to look up anything with the Nunavik region. It's if you've never seen it or heard of it. Um, Nunavik is the region. Um, any other questions that anybody may have? Oh, okay. Um, looking at your community now. Uh, and then the, the, there's like, as I mentioned, there's 14 communities altogether. And the smallest one being just under 200, you probably know 200 people. <laughs> and um, the biggest community being Kujuak, which is about 2,500. Wow. All right. All right, I think everyone's had a chance to ask their question. Um, I just want to thank Kitty again um, for being part of the speaker series. Um, and we'll we have a bit of a break before the next session starts, um, which I imagine will be short. <laughs> um, but uh, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experiences um, with us today. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to to share anything that uh, I, I, anything at all. Um, the more people know, the more awareness there is, the more um, we understand one another. So thank you for giving me the opportunity today. And um, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much.